Look, everyone, what's up? Welcome back to Premier State Investing. Today, we're going to be looking at Cytodyne. They're a small cap company. This is their chart. They had a letter come out from the FDA very recently in the last few days. And um, so the stock price dropped from about 275 uh, right around $2, descended the next day down to 181 It's climbed back up to 117 currently. So really, really interesting. And we're going to look at the mechanism of action. We're going to be looking at some different uh, riders from Insider Financial, who has responded to what they think about the FDA letter. So if you're not too familiar, they basically run drugs for uh, the Rona 19 and for HIV, 1.33 billion on the market cap, and not currently bringing in profits, so negative EPS. One of my habits is to go over and check out Finviz, but no results found for CYDY, which is their ticker. So we're going to have to keep looking. How about let's start with their pipeline? Here you can see. HIV. The main project we're going to be looking at today is called the Ronlimab. So let's get a definition from them. This is under their HIV section, but what it says, the target of the Ronlimab Pro 140 is important immunologic receptor CCR5. CCR5 receptor is protein located on the surface of a variety of cells, including white blood cells and cancer cells. On the white blood cells, it serves as a receptor for chemical attractants called chemokines. The CCR5 receptor is also a core receptor needed for HIV to infect healthy T cells. Recent research has identified the CCR5 receptor as an important target for many disease processes, including cancer, metastasis, and certain immunological conditions. Okay, so Laron Lamab, so the MAB monoclonal antibody, like it says here. Okay, so there's obviously a lot of interest with what's going on with the pandemic. So they have been running a couple trials. CD10 is for the mild to moderate, and then the CD12 is for severe patients. We're talking with folks in Brazil and currently in India as well. So the results overview, shortened time to recovery, the average length of hospital stay days, 33 days for Laurent Lamab, 38.5 for placebo, statistically significant. Probability of discharge alive, so 48.6% for Lamab, 43.2% for the control group. Not statistically significant. And this is again the graphical version of what we just looked at. So the mean ordinal score change at day 28, Lamab, you had an improvement of 1.5 points compared to 1.2 points. So, and then looking at the critically ill population, improvement in clinical status was four times higher at day 14 and more than two times higher at day 28 in the Laurent Lamab plus standard of care group compared to placebo plus standard of care. So you can see that here, plus 0.8 compared to plus 0 0.02. I'm sorry, 0 0.2. So that would be four times greater, significant p-value. And then day 28. So some of these things are going to be disputed by the FDA, and we'll look at that in a second. Primary endpoints, all-cause mortality. Okay, so this graph, we're going to be looking at the 28-day mortality, Laurent Lamab 16.6%, placebo 23.1, statistically significant, and then if you also include dexamethasone treatment, it's still 16.1 um, for Laurent Lamab as far as mortality at 28 days versus 21.8%, and this would be insignificant, so 5%, 5.52% uh, chance that it just it occurred by chance, these results. So they'd like to have better than 5%, so they would say this is statistically insignificant. And then it gets into Laurent Lamab safety profile, which is not the problem according to the FDA. So this is the letter from the FDA. It came out May 17th of 2021. A statement on Laurent Lamab, they basically say there's substantial public interest, so they wanted to put out a letter. It says the company has completed two clinical trials investigating Laurent Lamab for COVID-19. A smaller trial had 86 patients, and then that was for the mild to moderate, so that would be the CD10. And then a larger trial titled CD12, which included the 394 patients for um, severe symptoms associated with COVID. So they basically say it's, they want to underscore the significance of a well-designed trial. If the analysis of the primary and secondary endpoints do not support conclusions of the medicine's benefit, then the FDA considers subgroup analysis to be exploratory. And that's basically where this all hinges and where it's going is um, there was basically good results for elderly population. We'll look at some other people break it, break that down for us. But what they say is if it's only in a subgroup, then the analysis to be exploratory, meaning that they may inform the design of future trials, but do not support reliable conclusions about the medicine's benefit, focusing on only the most favorable of many subgroup analyses, even if the subgroups are pre-specified, can lead to overestimating the evidence of benefit. 
because regardless of the drug's true efficacy, some analyses are likely to appear favorable by chance when a small number of analyses are conducted. So with the conclusion of both CD10 and CD12 clinical trials, it's become clear that the data currently available do not support the clinical benefit of loronomab for the treatment of COVID. In the smaller study, cytodyne conducted in patients with mild to moderate disease, the CD10 trial, there was no observable effect on the, of the drug on the study's primary endpoints or on any of the secondary endpoints. So that's really weird considering all the graphs that we just looked at. But they say neither the primary nor any of the secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint for the CD12 trial relied on a measure of participants' COVID-19 symptoms called total clinical symptom score, which was assigned based on severity of each participant's fever, muscle aches, shortness of breath, or cough and cough. This score ranged from zero, so no symptoms, to 12, all four symptoms present and severe. The CD10 trial results showed no clinically meaningful differences in average change in, quote, total clinical symptom score from baseline to day 14 between the study arms, negative 3.5 in the Ronlimab group versus negative 3.4 in the placebo group. Additionally, none of the secondary endpoints were met in this study, including mortality, time to symptom resolution, and time to return to normal activity. Taken together, the CD10 results indicate that most study participants experienced resolution in COVID-19 symptoms regardless of whether they received lorolumab or placebo. Going over to the larger, uh, larger trial for the severe disease called the CD12, they say it also failed to find any effect of the drug on the primary endpoint, uh, study endpoint with no difference seen in mortality, so 20.5% in lorolumab treatment group and 216 in placebo treatment group or on any of the secondary endpoints. For example, with no difference on the average length of hospitalization, 21.4 days in both ronlimab and placebo treatment groups. Cytodyne has publicly communicated differences in small subgroups from the CD12 trial. For example, subgroup analysis of 62 of the 394 patients studied suggested that the data demonstrated a mortality benefit in certain patients who had received lorolumab. Subgroup analysis have well-established limitations, especially in the context of a clinical trial that have failed to show a benefit in overall study population. For example, small groups or subgroups are often small, and therefore imbalances are common. Here, the data from CD12 illustrates imbalances in mortality among subgroups, some favoring lorolumab and some favoring placebo. None of these analysis met statistical significance when using established and reliable analytical methods that correct for multiple comparisons. However, as noted before, such analyses may inform the design of future clinical trial investigation for lorolumab and the treatment of COVID-19. If Cytodyne plans a study, a further study of lorolumab to determine whether the drug can provide clinical benefit for individuals with the pandemic, FDA will continue to provide advice to the company on their development program. And so that was pretty harsh. If you want a nice overview of the comparison, I like this guy. He's from, I think his name is John Bream, B-R-E-A-M. So it's Bream Medical, and he does basically a side-by-side -side comparison of lorolumab from Cytodyne versus Banlenivimab. It's very still hard to say. This is uh, the drug from, it's a monoclonal antibody from Eli Lilly, and they have gotten the EUA approval for um, the one from Eli Lilly. Now, he thinks that lorolumab is a better drug, and he's referenced as, he's referenced in other article writers that we'll look at here in a second, but it's really nice. You just, you can just type this in. Um, it's just lorolumab versus bam len ivimab, and if you type Bream Medical or John Bream, you don't even have to be a Facebook user. It'll come up, and you can just watch it on your browser. So what they've kind of done is they said, well, we're going to go talk to other uh, agencies like in India. And recently they have this in the center is their CEO, uh, Nadarpur Hassan. Uh, this is, I believe his name is Mr. Kelly. I don't want to mess up his first name, but he's the CF. I believe he's the CFO. Anyway, um, they do a lot of work and come on proactive fairly often. One thing that's important, if you watch this, they say Cytodyne form supply and distribution deal with Indian firm for Lorolumab as coronavirus treatment. So um, they say because of the way that the because of the way that Lorolumab works, they say in this video that they don't have any concerns about variants, so Indian variants or what other other variants, um, because apparently it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't target um, the spike protein in the way that um, maybe some of these other therapies do. So anyways, but you can check that out. And if um, you're more knowledgeable about the science and you'd like to leave a comment, you can you can maybe describe for us why. Um, but they don't really explain. They just say they're not worried about the Indian variants. Fair enough. So here's from Insider Financial, OTC Market Stock News. They basically do a number of different articles. But they talk about, okay, if this thing kind of goes bad or badly, 
So they say different scenarios, failure to meet primary endpoints. So I guess if we're going to go with the um, FDA, that occurred. This website does argue in other, or I have seen other articles that argue that the FDA really didn't do a very good job in their analysis or they made certain presumptions or whatever. Another scenario, pres missed primary endpoints but hit secondary endpoints. So that didn't happen either according to the FDA. Met the primary endpoints and that didn't happen according to the FDA. Now they're talking about, so what else? Well, they have different ways to approval. They have HIV, they have leveraging foreign approval, like I just mentioned, talking to maybe in Brazil or the crisis that's going on in India. Label extension strategy. Um, breakthrough therapy designation. Long hauler trial, which I think we just saw in their corporate presentation was in phase two, if you saw that. Moderate approval, so that'd be, I guess, for CD10. But that doesn't look very likely. NASDAQ uplisting. So this article, Laurent Lamad trial results all but certain pointing to approval for cytodyne. So that's February 24th, 2021. Um, this all came out before this FDA letter. So then there's this other article from Insider Financial. Cytodyne uh, saves lives and reduces COVID-19 hospital duration. I mean, they put right here, six endpoints met after full data release. So shorts double down on trial failure narrative. And they outline all these people that are you know, shorting or putting out these different uh, articles. They talk about this guy a lot, Adam Firstine, Firstine, alias STAT News. So if you see something from STAT News, you should just know, like, th whatever their presumption is or where at least they stand, whether they're right or wrong. Um, so here's kind of the breakdown of what they say. The trial result summary is statistically significant. Due to an over-enrollment of patients greater than 65 years old, a modified intent to treat analysis was performed to standardize the data. And we saw that before. That's what M-I-T-T -T meant. When we were... So like we saw that here, M-I-T-T. So the MITT analysis of CD12 yielded the following statistically significant results of primary and secondary endpoints. So you have like a way, um, I don't know what to say. I mean, they're going to give you six different statistically significant primary endpoints. And the FDA says that they didn't meet any. We can go back and look at it. We're looking at the CD12. Failed to find any effect of the drug on primary study endpoint with no difference in mortality or on any of the secondary endpoints. So I guess this is on the primary study endpoint. So excuse me, I was wrong. So it meant, could mean that there's other primary study endpoints that they did hit on the CD12. Okay, that would make... So this is one, two, three, four, five, six statistically significant either primary or secondary endpoints. Kind of like what we saw in the investor presentation. So now they're going to explain to us what was the deal with this age adjustment. So then they give us this chart, the impact of age on CD12 mortality rate. And what do we have? Actual enrollment. So a lot more people. This is all over 65. A lot more people in the Ron Lamab. 36 deaths, 13 deaths. I guess this would be a proper age distribution. Adjusted, you'd have 32 deaths, Laurent on the map, 18 in placebo. So then you come down to the bottom line, age adjusted mortality, 18.91% and placebo 25.60. So then they kind of get into the details a lot. The study showed a 41.4% mortality rate and a 45% of patients who were over 70. In comparison, the placebo arm of the CD12 trial had 21.6 mortality rate, but it represented only 29.7% of people over the age of 65. So what they did, the placebo mortality rate from the critical care medicine study can be adjusted to different age distributions of 29.7 using ratios. Okay, so that's not that hard. So anyway, at the bottom of all this, they basically say, as stated earlier, typical mortality in severe critical population adjusted for the age distribution of the CD12 trial is 27.3. The difference is 1.7%, which is within the confidence levels of both studies. This adjusted mortality is almost a dead match for what the placebo group should have been. Until Cytodyne unveils the age-adjusted data on CD12 trial, this is the best analysis to handicap the potential discussions with the FDA regarding the potential emergency use authorization. Anyway, fifth graders can understand that the drug works. Status of the FDA, I guess, Janet Woodcock. So then they go on to make this argument, basically the head of the FDA is Dr. Janet Woodcock. And fortunately for Americans, she's a strong advocate of clinical outcomes and not p-values in an interview with a... So I don't know, finally they get to some numbers in other articles that put a stock price at $4. Here they're saying an approval for COVID-19 could propel the stock to $25 plus. 
getting it to a reasonable $15 billion market cap. So, I mean, today we're at what, $1.87. So this is like, I don't know, 18X or something, ballpark, maybe 15X, maybe 12X. Anyways, so then they go on, they put out, Cytodyne FDA letter is old news, international still progressing. So what this is basically about is they're talking that they're going to go look and talk to other countries if the FDA is going to give them such a difficult time. The FDA's statement rehashes clinical trial results and a new narrative. This FDA statement was like no other in recent memory and started with its rationale for composing it. The company still doesn't have a purchase order yet. The FDA was compelled to comment. It said the FDA recognizes substantial public interest in medicines to treat COVID-19. So some of the more vocal, this is Dr. John Bream. We already looked at his video. Dr. Bean, this is a, a different guy. Um, this is Dr. Bean. And then Randy Nicholas, I don't know who he is, but they all think that it's worthy of an EUA. So then they basically go on to say that the FDA screwed it up. Obviously, that's the point of this picture. There were, however, gross factual inaccuracies contained in the statement. They said they failed their secondary endpoints, but that simply isn't true. In the CD10 mild to moderate study, it nailed the news 2 endpoint and was statistically significant. So this would be, yes, statistically significant news 2. They also dismissed the subgroups as part of a post hoc subpopulation, but they were part of the statistical analysis plan. CD12 was a multi-arm study with severe and critical patient population. Since the critical patients were an arm of the study and not a subpopulation, it's disingenuous to say that they were subgroups. One of the pre-established secondary endpoints of the CD12 study was 12-day mortality. Therefore, they are completely within their bounds to declare a mortality benefit with a p-value of 0.23. The FDA statement closes with tidbits that things are still okay and moving forward. The statement said, quote, such analysis may inform the design of future clinical trials investigating Ronlimab for the treatment of COVID-19, end quote. Clearly, this is an olive branch that they are still working with Cytodyne to develop a protocol. The FDA said it will continue to provide advice to the company on their development program. I really like this this part of it. So the shorts would have you believe the drug is dead and not moving forward yet. The letter ends with, quote, we are committed to working with sponsors of novel therapies to facilitate development and approval of new treatments. The facts are that there is no warning letter. The drug is not on clinical hold. The trials are proceeding. The open label extension arm is continuing and the FDA is providing guidance on clinical trials. The letter was really more of a history lesson than an indictment that the drug doesn't work. Let's call a spade a spade. The FDA made the call on only allowing two shots of lorazepam and powering the trial with 400 people while mixing severe and critical together. While the FDA did not want to consider news 2 as an endpoint for approval, it was part of the protocol. By the tone of their letter, they clearly haven't had a good look at the study beyond the top line because they have ignored the significance of lorazepam on the secondary endpoints. Investors should not forget the DSMC also failed to make a successful recommendation to meet its endpoints. So it goes on, the FDA appears to be in CYA mode because India or Philippines could approve it and its success would give them a major black eye. International business development, so countries in play, Philippines, CSP revenue, India, EUA very possible, Brazil, full approval likely in September, Canada, interim order filling, uh, filing in June. Review. Countries are motivated to look at subgroups, but the FDA says clearly no subgroup analysis will be accepted. This is where the clinical trial data from CD10 and CD12 trials will really make a difference in the inter international arena. The company can also deliver the open label extension data, which was characterized as excellent. Then there are all these anecdotal studies which show very critically ill patients getting better and off the ventilator. Okay, so in the Philippines, leading the charge is Chiral Pharma, who is a commitment of 200,000 vials from cytodyne to sell via CSP to critically ill patients. Over 100 CSPs have been given, and the company gave guidance that the first 28 patients were tracking better than the critical patients in their CD12 trial. The company was expecting revenue in the form of a purchase order, which would legitimize the technology for investors and other regulatory agencies. Jumping over to India, the conditions in India are dire, which is why a large blue chip distributor like McLeod's reached out to Cytodyne to establish distribution in the country that is being ripped apart by the virus. In proactive investors video, the CEO was pretty confident that the approval was possible with a large clinical trial and that recruiting patients wasn't going to be a big issue. The beauty of this deal is that if they push it over the finish line, then there is possible expansion to other countries in need. They don't think twice about approving a drug that is dramatically altering the landscape of treatment for COVID-19. 
Another factor to consider are the horrific conditions in India where they can't even provide oxygen to people. Hospitals are getting overrun and bodies are laying in the streets. So, okay, so following that, so I don't know this drug, tocilizumab, drug development template, Leonromab could fit into that model quite well. It says this drug was awarded EUA after they completed a small 50 patient trial. And then when they failed their 800 patient trial, that was the end of the drug development, but would arguably be very bright future for cytodyne because we know the drug works. So they're just trying to get approval. Brazil, the clinical trial protocol is being finalized and the clinical trial sites are getting ready to recruit patients. The company anticipates 45 sites, which means the trial could go very fast. Another element that they may have been overlooked by investors is that the clinical trial protocol is against the standard of care. And right now that is pretty low. There's likely going to be a night and day difference. Brazil is slated to inject people in the CD16 and CD17 trials starting in June. They have 1,050 people in CD17 and 450 patients in the critical care trial CD16. Interim data could come as soon as August and mean an approval in September. Brazil is also going to have four shots versus two shots, which is a major benefit stacked up against the very low standard of care. There's a high likelihood that the enrollment in the trial could go much quicker than expected. Then in Canada, the situation in Canada isn't that great either. Canada has been, uh, Canada has given the company a rolling uh, biological license application review process. The company has given guidance that they could uh, be ready to file their final part of the BLA in June. So the latest top line data, the company just released top line data, mortality data that shows an 78% mortality benefit after day seven and 82% mortality benefit after 14 days. The issue is that only two doses were given in the clinical trial. So mortality benefit decreased to 50% in 21 days and 31% in 28 days. The FDA was primarily responsible for these poorly designed clinical trials that measured mortality when no active drug was being given between day 14 to day 28. The FDA is now on board with four doses, but the damage has been done. And Dr. Lazari, He said, when we had submitted the CD10 and CD12, we had proposed two doses for the mild and moderate and four doses for the severe and critical, and the FDA pushed back having to give two doses for both study populations. I've never actually been comfortable with that, and so the question I asked the committee was, was there a signal that might require cytodyne to adjust the CDL, uh, CD12 dosage? Are there patients who, particularly critical patients, who might need a third or fourth dose of lorolimab? Anyways, so going to their investment summary, it's clear now that Cytodyne's strategy of international approval is an excellent plan. In no way can this backward-looking FDA statement derail the progress in these international countries. Did they get a raw deal from the FDA? Of course they did. But until the laws change to put lives ahead of p-values, uh, this is the world we live in, and investors just need to cope. Last August, when the company didn't get an EUA in its mild to moderate trial, the FDA was starting to show its colors that data was more important than saving lives as they were fully committed to a vaccine strategy that had little bandwidth for therapeutics. Uh, the list of approved therapeutics is paltry given the all the efforts that has gone into clinical trials. Um, it was all about the vaccine and it still is. So that's kind of a wrap. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video and um, I, sh I should say that I do hold Cytodyne. It's um, maybe 3% of my portfolio. So I did buy most recently around $2 and we'll see we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens but um i think there's, there's a lot of opportunity personally um, definitely there haven't been there is uh so ban uh from eli Lilly have eua in the u.s um and also the uh, antibody cocktail from regeneron is available although you never hear about it uh, i had to do some digging because my parents are older just to find out how to get it and I didn't even really realize that it was uh, it had received approval. So, um, yeah, it's like you just never hear about these things. So there is, I do got to agree. I mean, when you turn on the news, it's a million times talking about this portion and very little about any treatments or therapy. So uh, best of luck to you guys. Hey, check out, we have another channel, but we have a video out for ivermectin if you're, um, if you're um, kind of in the waiting stage and you're concerned about your health. Uh, check that out. Um, I've been taking that for a month or so, and it's... it's been no problem for me. Anyways, all the best, you guys. Thanks.